Welcome to today's uh, complimentary webinar where we're going to discuss recent trends in private equity and corporate credit uh, with uh, Dr. Lev Bordofsky, the Chief Risk Officer here at Star Mountain and the editor of the Wall Street Journal's Daily Shot. Uh, my name is John Polis and I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at Star Mountain. For those of you who do not know us, we are a specialized uh, asset management firm focused on investing in the U.S. lower middle market. We employ a data-driven approach to providing value-added capital finance growth initiatives of established small and medium-sized companies. Our platform is powered by custom-built technology and a deep and experienced team that has been investing in the lower middle market since 2001. For those who are interested, we do have uh, our value-added lending fund three currently open. And if you'd like more information about that, please feel free to reach out to me at john.polis at starmountaincapital.com. Before I hand over the reins to Lev, I did want to let you know that your audio is muted and will be for the entirety of the presentation. Also, as a disclaimer, I wanted to note that nothing presented in this webinar or webinar materials constitutes an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to purchase by Star Mountain interest in any investment product. We have allocated time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. If you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A chat box of your WebEx client. We will try to get to as many questions as possible before hours up. Um, so getting started, Lev, a lot of chatter in the media, uh, in the news about private equity and corporate credit. We do look forward to uh, your presentation and your thoughts. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, I wanted to um, uh, do this this quarter's um, presentation focused on these these topics. Um, you can see uh, everybody chiming in on on private equity and and and, uh, and credit, especially um, sort of the uh, broadly syndicated uh, credit markets. Um, and their concerns from from the regulatory side as well as from uh, you know, some of the investors um, out there, and so I just thought w we can do a quick run through some of the some of the trends that I'm seeing, and um, you know, chat about what um, which direction things are moving and, and what are the risks around there. So let's let's go ahead and, and take a look at um, kind of the overview here. So on the private equity side, yeah, just a quick look at um, why there is such demand for private equity, why the growth is, is so rapid. Um, look at, uh, uh, you know, what's driving institutions to um, to load up on private equity and, you know, chase the, the, the biggest uh, funds out there. And then, you know, maybe um, um, mention a little bit about valuations and, and, um, and how um, they're pushing leverage higher and could potentially impact returns over the over the longer run. On the corporate credit, um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about trends in, in leverage and in, in credit. Um, and again, there's been a lot of talk about the overall corporate credit volumes relative to the GDP. Uh, talk a little about uh, default rates and uh, what's mitigating um, defaults from from going higher, and then uh, just briefly mention the the situation in investment grade credit because everybody's been focusing on leverage finance and high yield, um, but but it's uh, there's there are concerns now about investment grade credit. All right, so let's get started with the private equity component. Okay, so what's driving institutions uh, to uh, to invest in private equity? Um, and you know, if you look at uh, the demographics in, in this country, uh, if you look at what happens with um, defined benefit pension plans uh, as well as you know state pensions, uh, you'll see this trend where you know you have a teacher's pension. And you've got um, what what people call, refer to as a, a demographic cliff, where the, the number of active workers contributing to the pension is pretty flat, uh, but the number of retirees is rising. 
and uh and so you, so you got this this uh um this issue where you know the, somebody's got to fund these these guaranteed pensions for for the retiring teachers and so on um and um and there's less money coming into the pension so you know it forces these pensions to start really rethinking their uh return characteristics of, of their funds and on the right side you see this asset liability mismatch where if you just take um the overall assets and um and and track them over time and then you look at the liabilities uh, discounted to today, um, you'll see that there's a mismatch, uh, and and of course it depends on what rate you discount these liabilities with. Um, and in the past, the actuarial approach was, oh, you know, historically a combination of, you know, sort of credit bonds and 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 stocks and. Um, uh, produce an eight percent return, so we're going to discount everything at eight percent, and so it creates a, a small liability. The reality hit in recent years that wait a minute, we're not going to get eight percent return across all our assets, um, and so you got this this liability mismatch. And states are actively trying to pump money into these these pensions, but but uh, they just they don't have enough to um, to cover the gap. Um, so, you know, if you look on the, the chart on the left, the, the decision has been made, okay, we've got to boost returns. <laughs> we need that 8%. We need somehow to, to make 8%, and that's the pressure on the, uh, on the investment committees of these uh, organizations. And, uh, and how do you do that? Well, you, you look at stocks and bonds, and you say, well, you know, obviously that's kind of the bulk of our portfolio, but, but we've got to juice them up. Uh, and how do you juice them up? Well, you juice them with alternatives. Um, and alternatives, well, alternatives that typically mean things like real estate, hedge funds, uh, infrastructure, and private equity. If you look at those kind of four components, um, real estate and private equity are the ones where you can put a lot of money to work. Hedge funds, there's just a limited universe of them, and uh, you know some of them, you know, once they get too big, their returns suffer, and so so the uh, pensions realize, wait a minute, we're paying huge fees, but have kind of um, limited returns, and and so they, they the investment into hedge funds has stalled. It's basically uh, relatively flat. They're not boosting that a lot. But the, you know the, the buckets that are left are really infrastructure, real estate, and, and private equity. Infrastructure is, is very long term and, and could be shaky depending on, on what you do, but people still invest in them. Real estate, um, you know, in a low rate environment, um, unless you're taking risks and start investing in real estate in, in emerging markets. Uh, your returns are pretty low. I mean, your typical you know cap rates on, on you know, properties in the U.S. are, you know, 4%, depending on, on which type of real estate you're investing. So, so it's just not sufficient. And so it leaves private equity. And, and so uh, their, their pensions are just rapidly putting money into private equity. If you look at the chart on the right, it, it says that at the end of last year, a huge percentage of, of pensions have been saying that they're underinvested in private equity. It, it, it's um, uh, they just can't put money to work fast enough. So what that what that uh, generated was was this situation where larger funds, um, the most of the big and prominent private equity funds, are raising money very quickly. So if you look at the chart on the left, the the dark blue on the bottom shows that a third of the funds, of the it's mostly the big funds, closed their their funds in in um, less than a year. So basically, you know, seven to twelve months, 
was was a, you know a third of them, and and another almost third closed their funds in in less than eighteen months, um, between thirteen months and eighteen months, and, and so the the speed at which they're closing these new funds is is, is accelerated, and this is in in the first quarter of this year. Um, it's just the money's flowing quickly. They're closing their funds, and they're, and they're good, good to go. Right? They're ready to go. All of a sudden, they've got this capital. And so, what you know, if you look at global private equity, or private equity, private debt uh, across the board, the dry powder reached last year reached um, uh, two trillion dollars, and and that's even higher now. So. Um, all of a sudden, they, the, the pension said, oh, "Okay, we've committed our capital. Now the hard work begins. They got they got to deploy it, right?" Um, and and to continue with this theme, you you look at the uh, on the left, you'll see that the bulk of this dry powder, the, uh, the bulk of this capital, is um, is in the mega funds, the huge. Um, Funds that are greater than five billion a pop, right? Uh, that's the uh, the bar chart uh, on the right. Um, so all, all of a sudden, these these mega buyout funds uh, are flush with um, with with capital that they need to put to work. So the chart on the right gives a little bit of a breakdown between different kinds of buyout type uh, funds, and it shows the dry powder there. The the uh, the dark green is the traditional buyout. Then there's growth, which is also effectively a buyout, but but a different version. Uh, then venture capital and other. And you can see that the buyout component is 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 spiking. Just to um, to mention that the difference between the chart on the right here and the chart on the right here is this one specifically focused on sort of buyout type type um, investments. So all of a sudden, there's all this money to put to work. And when that happens, um, things become um, very competitive. Um, and uh, and so, you know, companies know this, and they are, you know, um, creating these bidding wars for, uh, you know, amid the, uh, the private equity companies' buyout uh, funds. And all of a sudden, your valuations are starting to look pretty frothy, right? So if you look at uh, sort of 2007, your typical buyout multiple, uh, you know, um, purchase price to EBITDA uh, was around 10, right? Now it's around 11. Uh, so um, you've got this uh, dynamic where um, <laughs> It's, it's so competitive in that large space that that these funds are basically willing to pay um, pretty high multiples. And how do they get comfortable with these high multiples? Well, the way they do this is, you know, they they have analysts that open up their, their spreadsheet models and they say, okay, you know, if this company produces this kind of revenue, what do we need to to juice it by? To get our our targeted returns, well, the way the way we we need to juice it is is by putting on more leverage on it, right? And so if you in a, in in the model, if you increase your leverage, your re returns obviously or get get better, and then you, you tr basically you're competing the you know with uh, vintages that were so if you look at a, a 2013 vintage. Because the multiples were lower, you need a um, much higher leverage now to produce the same returns. And so this is what's happening. All of a sudden, because of these uh, uh, this, this pressure to to juice up returns and the um, competition to acquire companies, uh, also all of a sudden these this highly leveraged buyouts. Are, are becoming common. And again, take a look at this chart where it compares 
the percentage of buyouts um, in 2007, which was the peak, pre-recession pre peak versus now, okay? So the percentage of six times leverage or greater and seven times leverage or greater versus um, uh, versus 2007. This is and this is debt leverage. So this is not the, the valuation. This is actual debt leverage. So so this is this is the uh, trend that is spooking. Um, both investors and, and regulators, right? Um, you know, it, it's it's hard to sort of look at this and say, oh, things are fine. It, it's 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 a little scary. So let's summarize this. Um, the again, the buyout space um, in, in so large buyout firms has become extremely competitive. Um, and, uh, you know, pensions continue to pump capital. And, and the way pensions think about it is, again, they, they look at, you know, 2013 vintage fund, the 2012 vintage fund. They say, hey, this thing returned, you know, 13, 14%. They don't think, oh, it, we're in a different environment. We're a different part of the cycle. They're, in their models, they still expect 13, 14% return on, on their investment, right? So they view the current investment that they're making into private equity as, as being consistent with what it was, you know, five, seven years ago in the previous vintage fund. Um, and so that's what they expect. And, and of course, large private equity firms uh, show their track records from, from, you know, 2013 and say, hey, you know, this is what we did. And therefore, implicit in that, expect the same return. Uh, but to get that return, um, it's going to be much more challenging because you, your, your valuations are crazy and your, your leverage is much higher. Again, if the economy hums along and continues to, to grow, it's possible that, that they will get decent returns. But if there's a hiccup in growth, uh, you know, it, there's a vulnerability. So all of a sudden, again, you have this massive amount of dry powder chasing a limited number of companies. You know, the, the, the number of companies in the U.S. isn't growing that rapidly or isn't growing at all, right? So all of a sudden you have, you know, um, one and a half to two trillion dollars chasing the same number of companies that, that were around, you know, uh, five, seven years ago when, when you had, uh, you know, two-thirds or even half of that amount of capital going after these companies. It just creates a very competitive environment. It takes longer to put money to work, but there's increasing pressure to put money to work because pensions expect the money to be deployed. Um, and so, you know, as a result, we'll see, most likely we'll see performance suffer. And portfolios are vulnerable to um, to an economic slowdown. And, and it, by economic slowdown, I mean basically revenues, um, you know, all of a sudden are not growing or actually declining. And and so now you've got all this leverage to support lower revenues, right, and potentially higher costs. Um, so that that dynamic uh, could cause, uh, you know, basically makes makes these portfolios very vulnerable. Okay, so continue with kind of the the credit the leverage aspect of it. Let's take a look at corporate credit and what the trends are. Um, so. This, this is the chart that spooks banks and, and um, regulators and, and investors, right? It shows that just the, if you look at corporate credit, um, and this is it, it basically every, everything, um, you know, all total credit um, uh, as, a, as a fraction of the GDP, right? And people say, if you look at the green line, that's the gross corporate debt. 
uh, loans and bonds, a, a fraction of the GDP, and that's a, that a that's a uh, basically a record highs. And, and so, you know, um, if you, some you know some years ago, some analysts would say, "Oh, wait, no worries, because there's so much cash on uh, on these companies' balance sheets." that uh, you should really be taking the net. So you take the debt minus the cash and, and look at that um, as a percentage of the GDP. But now, all of a sudden, that net um, debt number is near, near peaks as well. And you can see what happened when, the, when we reached the peak, right? Uh, we, we basically hit a recession every time for the last three times. So, um, you know, now now all of a sudden people are concerned about the net net debt outstanding as well and and what it means. Um, and, and so th this is this is the chart that that really uh, makes people nervous about corporate credit. If you just look at leverage loans. Um, and you look at the um, the leverage by basically by taking the ratio of of debt outstanding to the EBITDA, which is the you know earnings of the of the company. Um, that leverage all in is now above the peak of 2007 on leverage loans. And what people argue is like, wait, well, it's a, it's a different story now because we we now have we're not cushioning it with, um, you know, we have some second lien and and um, other senior debt underneath the loan amount. But but even first liens and these large uh, syndicated loans um, is is now the leverage is now above. Uh, the, the 2007 peak, right? Uh, yes, there, there's less subordinated debt now to worry about, uh, but you know there are other types of cushions that they're trying to put in. But it's you know it's still you, you're still looking at a trend in leverage that that's pr pretty high. And and again, this is where um, regulators are getting concerned, um, and and some some investors are getting concerned. So if you look at history, right, historical trends, um, given this this amount of leverage, or this, this, this amount of debt, corporate debt as a percentage of the GDP, right, uh, you would expect defaults to start rising, uh, which what which is what happened in in so sort of previous cycle. So you look at uh, sort of um, you know, the late 80s, um, as the um, GDP, uh, as the debt to GDP climbed, um, you know, defaults picked up, and a similar thing happened in sort of 2001, and, and then a similar thing happened in 2007, 2008. Um, and, and so, but now all of a sudden you look at it and you say, okay, defaults are pretty low, right? And and that's uh, people are saying is that um, is that just a um, uh, you know a temporary thing and, and we're we're looking at potentially a, a spike in defaults coming up uh, so it's a concern. At the same time, people are also looking at uh, the economic slowdown, uh, which is is clearly happening. Um, and saying, you know, spreads are too low. So default rates are, are low, uh, and as a result, spreads are too low. Yeah, so this chart shows the um, comparison between um, the Chicago Fed's National Activity Index, which is a, a, a measure of um, economic activity in the U.S., and high yield spreads. And you'll see that, uh, and, and the Chicago Fed national activity is inverted, so the higher number means lower activity. Um, and you'll, you'll see that um, 
you know, activity has slowed in, in sort of recent months, um, in part due to the, um, tr you know, trade tensions that, that are out there and uncertainty around that. Um, while high yield spreads are not budging, or, you know, they rose a little bit, but not nearly enough. And so what's the explanation for that? And the explanation is that, um, you know, companies are still very profitable and, and cash balances are high. Um, so if you look at debt as a, as a percentage of internal funds, um, it, it hasn't risen that much. I mean, it's higher, but it's not that high, right? So the blue the blue line here shows the net debt, so um, debt minus cash as a percentage of internal funds, and and that that's been the mitigant uh, behind um, you know low default rates. Um, there's the profitability is high. The company is generating a lot of cash, and and that's holding default rates low. And again, that is contingent upon um, a strong economic growth, right? Uh, that that keeps profitability going. Um, you know, strong consumer spending and so on. If that were to um, substantially slow. Um, you know, all bets are off, and and so this 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 risk mitigant that's been around for for a while, which is what this is how uh, companies are able to to raise raise this amount of debt, um, is only contingent on on economic growth, um, and that and that's that's a concern. So, in terms of uh, the, if you look at the overall leverage finance space, you'll notice that um, loan balances have been rising pretty pretty steadily. Uh, and part of the reason for um, the, this demand for leverage loans has been, um, um, you know, a low rate environment. Uh, people people have been looking for you know, floating rate product that will um, um, give them some protection against the rising rates, um, and at the same time give them a, some current yield. Uh, as, uh, you know, leverage loans typically are floating rate instruments, right? So the coupon is linked to LIBOR. It's usually LIBOR plus a spread, like LIBOR plus 300 basis points, and which means that if you know, so all of a sudden rates rise very quickly, your coupon increases. And and that was attractive to a lot of both institutional and individual investors as well uh, who bought it, bought leveraged loans through funds. Uh, and that created this, this massive demand for leveraged loans. So the, the, the market grew dramatically. And um, part of the growth has also been uh, to the demand for um, CLO debt, which is, you know, you basically take a bunch of loans uh, and securitize them. And, and uh, CLOs uh, have been seeing demand in, um, you know, um, in Asia, especially in Japan, where they would buy the senior tranches and, and get a, an extra yield from those. Uh, and that also created um, sort of some some uh, tailwind for uh, for the leverage loan market. So leverage loans ha have had uh, quite a quite a, a, a spurt in, in 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 growth. And that, again, that was a big concern, and it remains a big concern for uh, if you look at the media and, and uh, you know investments investor statements and and, uh, and regulators. Growth in leverage loans has been has been an issue. Um, but it's um, it's less of an issue when you consider uh, the whole leverage finance um, universe, right? So if you if you look at yes, l l the leverage loan 
uh, balanced and rising, but high-yield bond, high bonds outstanding have actually been declining. And so on the right chart, if you look at the um, green line, um, it, that's the total leverage finance universe. And it shows that the leverage finance market as a whole, loans plus bonds, um, has been uh, relatively steady for the last few years. Um, and, and it's important to note that lo leverage loans and bonds are somewhat fungible, um, where companies look to see how they can finance their, their operations, and they can switch between the two. And, and actually what has been happening recently is as um, fears of high, higher interest rates declined, um, you know, the demand for leveraged loans have, have, have kind of waned a bit because, you know, you don't need, a, if, if rates stay low, you don't need a floating coupon. You're not worried about raising your know, rising rates. And so people have been, investors have been shifting to higher bonds from leveraged loans. And companies seeing that are more than willing to accommodate. So what they're doing is they're seeing more demand for higher bonds, less demand for loans. So they, they go out there and issue a, a, a higher bond and refinance, use the proceeds to refinance their loans. So they're switching between the two. And so uh, these two products in, in leverage finance are somewhat fungible, so it's unfair to look at just one or the other. Um, and so one argument could be made that leverage finance as a whole isn't as much of a problem because together high yield bonds and leverage loans are, are not out of control. They're, they're pretty stable, uh, relatively speaking. However, now there's increasing focus on investment grade bonds. And what's going on in investment grade bonds is, is that you have um, look at the universe of, of what constituted investment investment grade bonds um, you know a couple of decades ago, you would have had um, a much lower concentration of triple B debt and a much higher concentration of um, A to triple A, right? So uh, the, the chart on the left shows that, that trend. You know, you started out with 30% 30, 30 triple B and 70% triple A uh, to, to single A, right? And all of a sudden now you're you're in a situation where uh, triple B, which is still investment grade, but triple B is now higher than all the single A to triple A combined, right? Uh, and so what's been happening is the this uh, deterioration in in quality of the investment grade universe. And what people are concerned about is <clears throat> this triple B universe has gotten so big, right, that a, an economic slowdown could result in downgrades of these triple B bonds. And, uh, you know, they'll become, I guess, what they call fallen angels, which is going from investment grade to high yield. So once you downgrade below to a triple B minus, you go into the high yield universe. Right, and so that chart was so earlier, where the green line here on the right, uh, we have pretty steady leverage finance universe, right? That could spike if you all of a sudden have migration from the investment grade world, right? Um, and so, so now all of a sudden you're, you're looking at a, a investment grade portfolios which are much riskier than they used to be. And what's happening with that is, is that um, the chart on the right, uh, yeah, obviously rating agencies are, um, uh, they're, they're afraid because they, they got burnt in, um, in, in 2007 
based on on some of the mistakes made in, in their you know ratings strategies, um, and and they're pretty vigilant about downgrading debt, and so they're looking at a lot of these triple B investment grade bonds and rapidly downgrading them. So th this chart on the right from Citi uh, shows that um, if you you know, energy has been volatile, has been downgraded and upgraded because of the oil prices. Um, and then, you know, financial is kind of the, its own universe. If you exclude those, um, you'll see the, the dark line shows that um, all of a sudden you have, um, you know, significant downgrades already happening in the um, – uh, in the investment grade universe, and that could accelerate, right? And, and that's the concern. It's not as much the that you have a spike in defaults in this in this universe. You know, investment grade bonds default pretty rarely, um, but the this migration from um, from investment grade to high yield that that's a real issue, and and that could put pressure all of a sudden when when, invest, when when high yield bond universe starts you know getting larger because of all of these um, fallen angels coming in um, it will put pricing pressure on on the rest of the high yield universe and and, and you know spreads will will blow out so so that that's the concern right now with the investment grade uh, world universe Okay, so let's summarize this, this credit component. Uh, so corporate debt to GDP ratios are um, continue to push higher, um, and um, both net, both gross and net, are uh, you know the net amount is what what people are not focused on is approaching you know your typical end of the cycle peak, right? So, which which basically says we are nearing the end of the cycle, and um, you know, caution is is called for. All right. Um, so, your, your large syndicated loans, um, the leverage has risen in recent years, um, and um, my guess is it will stop rising as long as there's this, these jitters. In, you know, in the markets uh, about trade because people are just not not sure what you know. There's a lot more uncertainty, but it's it's already pretty high. Um, you know, and then you know, based on the the amount of debt relative to the GDP, amount amount of corporate debt relative to the GDP, defaults should be rising, right? Um, but they're not, uh, and they're not rising because you know. Profitability has been strong. Companies have been doing well, and there's a lot of cash on on balance sheets. Um, and by the way, it's worth noting that last year saw the biggest decline in cash on corporate balance sheets in several years, um, and and that's that's important to note because that trend, if it continues, will boost that. Um, uh, corporate debt to GDP, net debt to GDP ratio, um, um, to a new high, and, that, and that's a concern. So, you know, again, people are worried about what happens when uh, the economic growth stalls. And, and you talk to people, that, and, and they're basically like ostriches with their heads in, in, in the sand. Uh, they're like, oh yeah, things are fine, right? But you know this expansion has been going on, um, you know, for a decade, and it, no matter how you slice it, it's it's very unusual for an expansion, even a slow one, to last that long. So, um, you know, at some point, and this is not going to go on forever, right? So at some point, you you have a, a slowdown, and it's it's a matter of who, a matter of musical chairs, who's stuck with the. The riskier assets when the you know when that slowdown happens, and that that's what concerns some investors. I mean, for now things are fine, and you have strong corporate earnings and and, and lots of cash. 
Uh, but that's that's not the you know for a longer term investor that's that's not necessarily something to bet on. And finally, you know, while the leverage finance universe where, where everybody's been focused on and people are worried about is appears to be relatively steady in terms of its size, uh, you get you get a you got a deterioration of uh, credit quality in um, in investment grade in the investment grade universe. So, on that note. Um, I just want to say um, thanks, everybody, for um, uh, for joining in, and uh, maybe we'll take some questions. Th th thanks again, Lev, uh, um, and again to everybody. Sorry about the uh, um, some of the technical difficulties at the beginning. I think we we only started about two minutes late, so uh, so we're right on time. Uh, Lev, uh, w what are some of the theories behind the decline in cash on on corporate balance sheets? Ah, it's a good one. Um, one of them is that um, the tax change, the re reduction in um, uh, U.S. corporate taxes, has um, uh, incentivized the multinationals to bring their cash from abroad, right? So they, they're holding cash in Ireland or, or um, you know, um, Kate, the Caymans or somewhere else, uh, you know, where they generated cash abroad and they don't want to bring it to the U.S. because it, it would trigger taxes. Once the, the, you know, you had a reduction in taxes and you had the, the tax holiday where if you, if you bring in cash, uh, you'll pay a smaller tax one-off um, incentivized these companies to bring cash from abroad. And of course, when they brought it from abroad, they didn't want to sit on it. They paid it out in, in, uh, in dividends and, and mostly bought back stocks, right? Uh, and so that ended up reducing cash balances. But there, this is just one reason. It was kind of, I think it's the main reason, but there are yes. other explanations for it as well. And, w and was that a one, uh, you know, something that you saw one time last year or, are we, or is that trend still continuing? Uh, I think they're pretty much done. I think I think they're, last year they a lot of these firms um, started bringing money from abroad and 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 basically buying back shares, and that's why you had the spike in in share buybacks in the public markets, um, and, uh, and 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 you know boosting dividends and doing things like that. But share buybacks was the were kind of the main reason last year, and that slowed down already. Um, I think there are a couple of companies I've seen still doing it, but but I think it's pretty much done. So so Lev, historically, how do buyout P returns compare to public equity performance? Yeah, so so if you look at uh, say your uh, passive buyout investment, let's say you just take randomly take a, a bunch of buyout funds and create an index out of them. Uh, and on a five-year basis, which is you know long enough to to actually get some some monetizations, uh, your um, S&P 500 was was just under 12% return, and your buyout funds were were on average about 14% return. Right, so the, the about a two percent difference between the S&P 500 and and your buyout index, and you know if you talk to um, economists, what they will say, and, and, you know, it's a little bit of oversimplification, but what they will say is that 2% differential is basically um, two things. It's, it's the um, uh, illiquidity risk. So it, you, you, by, by when you invest in private equity, you do buyouts, you, you, you invest in, a, in an illiquid instrument, and therefore your um, – you're asking for for higher returns because um, you, you've lo you've locked up your money. That's number one. Number two is, you know, the leverage. Obviously, in in a, in a growth environment, leverage boosts returns, and and so that that differential between the public market and the private market is, is the combination of um, by by private market, I mean leverage buyout market. It's a combination of illiquidity and um, and leverage. Uh, 
um, regarding PE returns uh, and deteriorating PE returns, uh, how, how much can they deteriorate if the economy slows? And I believe uh, in one of the slides you said that mega funds returns will suffer. Won't funds of all sizes suffer? As time is just yeah. yeah, so private equity will generally have a tough time in this, you know, in this downturn. Uh, it probably won't be as, as challenging as sort of 2008, which, you know, which is the extreme. Um, but, again, pensions are sitting there thinking, okay, you know, we budgeted, um, you know, we budgeted 14% return for, for a, you know, 12% return for our private equity funds um, because that's what the early vintages return, mm -hmm. right? Their average... In a, in a in a slowdown scenario like like a, a you know a recession, the average will probably dip down to lower single digits. You're probably going to see returns of, of something like four percent, uh, and possibly lower, right? Um, so that's the down downside case. You know, my my guess is it's not going to go to zero or negative, simply because if you diversify enough, um, you know, unless you have a a really deep recession, um, you know, there, there's, there should be a positive return around there. But, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of variability. So for, you know, some funds will do better and some funds will, will have negative returns. But on average, you, you'll you probably see, um, you know, kind of a 4% return. Because some, some portfolio companies will basically default, right, and will have to be restructured. Mm -hmm. Uh, but um, but the others will survive, and so that that's kind of the, the uh, kind of my projection of where you know what's the down down case is. But even in, in the best case scenario, even if the, the, the somehow you don't get a slowdown, you're just not going to get the returns you got in, in 2014, right? 2013. Um, you know those vintages are gone, and so you, you're looking at kind of single digit returns. Um, in the best best case scenario. Uh, some, somewhat related, what do you think would be a catalyst to make high yield spreads widen from here? Yeah, um, uh, you know, clearly a uh, decline in, in corporate earnings, um, and you know, to me, the, the biggest one is is obviously the uh, the situation, the, the macro situation with with trade. Uh, so watch high yield spreads blow out if we have this, um, you know, uh, upcoming meeting um, with Trump and uh, Xi Jinping and nothing comes out of it and Trump imposes, um, you know, tariffs on the rest of the you know, Chinese imports. Um, you know, all of a sudden you have a disruption in the supply chains, and and a lot of these high-yield companies uh, are uh, vulnerable to that um, scenario, and and you will see spreads blow up. So, of how were corporations able to borrow so much in the first place? Yeah, and, and this is this has been a big debate, and. One of the reasons, uh, and probably the key reason, is if you look at uh, what the Fed has done over the past decade, right? You know, pushed the rates into um, record low levels, and not only were short-term late rates low, uh, longer-term rates, uh, you know, Treasury yields were uh, near record lows, and with with that with, with kind of safe, you know, risk-free rates at near zero, right, demand for returns sent investors looking for, for yield. And they, they were, it, it's the usual thing, you know, people, mm -hmm. um, you know, fight the previous war, right? Uh, you know, generals fight the, the previous war. Um, People are like, oh, I'm not. I'm staying out of uh, uh, consumer credit because 
you know, mortgages and consumer credit, that's what suffered in the last uh, recession. But, um, you know, corporate credit did fine in the last recession overall, right, relative to, to other, other types of credit. And therefore, I'm going to load up on corporate credit. And so the demand for corporate credit spiked. And so all of a sudden companies said, wait a minute, we can, we can finance ourselves at ridiculously low rates, um, and, and they've locked in, you know, these low rates um, by issuing longer-term debt, and they issued a lot of it. And so that low-rate environment that persisted for a long time um, forced cash into, into corporate credit, and companies were willing to oblige. They were like, okay, you know, you, 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 want, uh, you, know, you, you want debt? Here we go. And, and so that, that's how the whole thing basically uh, grew rapidly. Any uh, any comments regarding the the bond markets relative to this? You mean the the, uh, the treasuries treasury markets or, or yeah. the corporate? Yeah. So so the treasury markets are um, all of a sudden right now uh, are, are back to kind of lower levels and potentially they go lower again because of concerns of around uh, the economic slowdown and low inflation. Um, and uh, and that, it obviously invites more cor- corporate uh, corporate issuance. Um, but again, if this this trade situation unravels, um, you know, treasury yields will, will go lower. You could have a, a, the ten year back below two percent again. And uh, what about this? What about some of the uh, the rumors that we're hearing about a a lowering of the of the interest rates by the Fed? Yeah, it's it's a strange scenario. Um, like this morning, uh, inflation uh, numbers came out, and they were they were uh, relatively benign. It's actually inflation was below expectations, and uh, um, and so. Between that, you know, employment numbers that came in well below forecasts um, last Friday, now you have a situation where where the market expects the Fed to start cutting rates soon, like this summer. Right. And, uh, um, yeah, I, I'm personally surprised by that. Um, you know, just – you know, when you raise rates in, in December, that you're going to be lowering them, you know, nine months later, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, and my, my, my personal view is that the Fed is not going to lower rates immediately. They need lower rates in the fall uh, if, if the situation, if the kind of slow growth and low inflation persists. But they're going to be more in wait-and-see mode for now. Mm-hmm. And you, you mentioned uh, jobs reports. We, we, I think the, the last jobs report uh, came out earlier this week, last week, said that the uh, number of jobs created in the month were down, yet we see the employment reports, and we have still have the highest level of employment in decades. W- what does your data show? Yeah, so there are two things going on. Um, one is that... Um, there's a there's a limited pool of workers out there, right? If you think about it, our population growth is 0.7% um, per year. Of that, I think 0.3% is what what they call natural growth, meaning birth rates, mm-hmm. uh, and the rest is immigration. Um, and if you if you tighten immigration, that the population growth is just going to slow them further, right? So you, your economy is growing at you know four or five percent on a on a, a nominal basis, right? How do you grow the economy without without growing the labor force? Right. And and so you, you know, the economy is growing. It's, it's saying, give me more workers, give me more workers, right? And so you pull out all these all these people who were not in the workforce. You know, stay-at-home moms and, and people who who were um, just staying home all of a sudden, like, hey, you know, salaries are better. There's a lot of demand. Let me get back to work. 
and that's been creating jobs because you know you pull you pull people out of out of the you know outside of the labor force. All of a sudden, you're going to run out of those people. And I think part of the issue now, that's what's happening. We're running out of um, new employees. You just can't find them. You know, uh, especially somebody with a little bit of skill. You know, try to find somebody like that. It's it's just really difficult, right? You just got to poach somebody from another place. And that's a that's a zero sum game, you know. You're not creating new jobs. You're just taking somebody from one place to another. And so job creation is slowing because I think lack of workers. But mm-hmm. also at the same time, companies are with with the trade situation. Companies are getting a little cautious, mm-hmm. and and so they're 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 like, oh, you know, rather than overpaying for somebody right now, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off. I'm not gonna grow the business as, as quickly. Because of the uncertainty, so those are the two things that, that I think are the drivers. Yeah, there was a good article in uh, in the journal this week uh, regarding the former point, where many companies just just can't find the skilled workers to uh, to hire. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's a big, it's a big challenge. Know, yeah, yeah. Try to find a uh, an electrical engineer right now. Just, yeah. just just try one. You just can't. You, you know they, they're just not available. Or, or, or worse yet, try to find somebody to pick your your vegetables in the field. <laughs> you know, unless you go the illegal route, which is also difficult. Right. You can't find a worker. You just nobody's going to do it. You know, uh, in Iowa, pig farmers right uh, uh, are having trouble uh, finding people to take care of the pigs. And so they're resorting to illegal immigrants. Yeah. And so, you know, I was fighting illegal immigration. At the same time, the, the, the pig farmers are saying, you know, we have two and a half percent unemployment in Iowa. Uh, I, I can't I can't manage my business. Right. right. So, so that those are the issues that they're out there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I know we went off topic a little bit, but uh, but but. Uh, you know, we we do appreciate it. Always great um, information, um, as always. Uh, thanks very much again, Lev. Yes, yeah. and uh, thanks for, thanks everybody for joining. Yeah, and and we we had our we had our largest uh, um, attendance so far for one of these. So uh, you, know, so, you know, so we continue to grow our audience, which uh, which is always promising. That means that means they must like what you have to say. Great. So, uh, so for everybody, that's it. We're going to wrap up today. Uh, thanks for everybody who signed in, as well as uh, to Lev for the great presentation. Should anyone have any further questions or feedback, please feel free to email them to us at webinars at starmountaincapital.com. We will be sending to everybody uh, tomorrow a copy of the slides that Lev, uh, that Lev presented, along with a link to this replay. Uh, you know, feel free to feel free to share that. And again, if you have any questions, you know, just, just uh, feel free to reach out to, uh, to us. And that's it for today. Thanks, everybody, and uh, have a great rest of the week.